Have your seat. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning at Edge Church. Great to see you guys and so excited about what God is doing through this series, Double Dog Dare You. And before we get started, I, I tell you what, I just have a confession to make. And my confession is I am afraid of feet. I, I have a feet phobia. Now, I like my own feet, but, but I worry about other people's feet. And feet are kind of nasty, aren't they? You know, when people come over to the house and they say, Ryan, do you want us to take off our shoes? I'm always like, no, please leave them on. I don't care how much snow or mud or grime may be on your shoes, just leave them on, you know, because, because I'm, I've got this foot phobia. And feet are nasty, aren't they? I mean, if you think about it, feet touch areas and things that the rest of the body will never touch. You know, I'm talking about like the community shower at the dorm room or the public restroom at the swimming pool and all kinds of things like that. Yeah, feet are nasty, man. Blisters, calluses, athlete's feet. Some people have fungus under the big toenail, you know. It's not good. Some people have like hobbit feet, you know, with the big hairs hanging out of the feet, you know. That's nasty. No to hobbit feet. I'm afraid of feet, I'm telling you, afraid of that. Well, Jesus was not afraid of feet, and thank goodness he wasn't. In John chapter 13, Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples with all of the funkiness going on, all those weird toes sticking out all over the place, Jesus is washing those feet. It's the night of the Passover meal, it's, it's the, the final hours that Jesus has in the upper room, he's observing this final final meal with the disciples. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be crucified. And it is in that context that Jesus begins to do something that is shocking and amazing, and that is he begins to wash the feet of the twelve. He begins to wash these feet. Now, in the culture of the ancient world, uh, it was customary to wash the feet of your guest. A host would invite somebody to their home. A servant would wash the feet. The host didn't wash the feet. The servant washed the feet. And that was a way to, for, the, for the guest to kind of relax and kind of enjoy being in, in that home. And, you know, in the ancient world, they didn't have paved roads and people wore sandals. And so if it was muddy, you had, you know, dirt caked onto your legs and your toes. And if it was kind of dry, you would have dust and all kinds of other weird things all over your feet and your legs and and so to wash someone's feet was the custom but it was always done by the servant and yet Jesus finds himself here in John 13 doing the work of the least of these and yet Jesus is the most significant how how does that work how's that how's that, how's that happen this night before his crucifixion Jesus is teaching a profound lesson to his disciples and it's interesting because the disciples are the ones that are about to abandon him. You know, sometimes we have this idea, we're like, oh, the 12 apostles, and we've seen their pictures on stained glass windows, and we've read about them from the Bible and all of the amazing things that they did for the Lord. But, but in this moment, the disciples were about to abandon Jesus. Judas is about to give that sinister kiss to the cheek of Jesus and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Peter's about to deny him three times, and the rest of the disciples were about to abandon him, and yet Jesus is still washing their feet, knowing all of that. It's amazing. The great servant. Oftentimes a, a lecturer or a teacher would lecture in the context of a meal, but Jesus is going to preach a sermon not by what he says, but by what he does. And I believe those are the most powerful sermons of all, is, is, is what our life says, what we do, not just what we say, because we can say all kinds of things. But with no latex gloves and no tough act and tenactin and no manis and petties, Jesus begins to get down on his hands and knees and to scrub the feet of the disciples. You know, Psychology Today produced an article a couple of years ago that, 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 was a study and it concluded after many years of research and hundreds of people that they studied that that people that serve others people that volunteer or serve others for a minimum of two hours a week that they are people that actually had a longer lifespan they lived a healthier life they were happier and they managed their stress better is that not amazing see we live in a world where 
everybody's worried about me and my and what do I want to do and what's my opinion and, and how do I feel about this. And yet God has created us to, to serve others. And when we do what God is commanding us to do and what we're going to see in this passage, then that's when our life really becomes blessed. That's when we experience the joy of Jesus and his abundance. So Jesus is washing these feet of the disciples. I remember one of the first times that I really began to think about this scripture was when I was a college student. And I don't know about you, but when I was in college, I was very idealistic. You know, <laughs> Maybe you weren't, but when I was in college, I was. And I read this passage and I thought, we need to wash the feet of all of the students in our Bible study. What a great idea, Ryan. And so I got a bunch of people together and we got a bunch of bowls and we filled them up with water and we took them down to this classroom where we had a Bible study. We had about 40 or 50 college kids in the room. And I read the passage and announced to everybody we were going to have this sacred moment. And everybody took their shoes off and kind of lined up. I want to tell you, that was the nastiest thing I have ever done in my entire life. Uh, after I had washed the feet of the second student, the water was black. I mean, it was utterly disgusting. And I still had a line full of people. And I tell you, I've washed no feet since then, you know. Praise the Lord. You know, there, th throughout Christian history, there are churches that have practiced foot washing as an ordinance of the church, kind of like baptism and communion and foot washing. I'm thankful to God we're not that church, you know. <laughs> I don't mind serving you, but I, I, I'm not going to wash your feet. But. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus did. And I love this because it shows us that Jesus was not afraid to get his hands dirty. That's what servants do. Servants get their hands dirty. When you start to serve somebody that's struggling with an addiction, you get your hands dirty. When you're trying to encourage somebody that's trying to run to the divorce court and you're telling them, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, you get your hands dirty. Servants who help people get their hands dirty. And this is what Jesus is doing in John chapter 13. I want us to open our Bibles this morning to this 13th chapter, and I want to read the first two verses. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. So this is kind of the setup verse. Passover meal, the upper room, Jesus and the twelve, and 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 Jesus is about to be crucified and betrayed. But but there's three things this morning I want us to see in the life of the servant. And here's the first thing that servants do. Servants take initiative. Servants take initiative. If you're a servant, you're a person that 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 initiates service. You 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 see a need and you respond to it. A lot of times we wait. And, and a lot of times we say, well, I don't mind helping if somebody is asking. But did you know some of the most profound moments in your life will be moments where you have an opportunity to serve and you were not asked. You volunteered. You know, you signed yourself up. Nobody asked Jesus to, to, to wash the feet of the disciples. Jesus saw a towel and he saw a bowl and he saw dirty feet. And he put the equation together and said, that's me. Now see, there was one person that's missing from this meal, and that is the servant. Peter and John had gone ahead of the twelve to make the preparations for the Passover meal because the lamb had to be sacrificed in a certain way, and there were herbs, and there was wine and bread, and there's a certain order and a certain cadence and a rhythm to the Passover meal in the Jewish tradition. And, and they get all that together, but there's one person that's missing. That's the servant. Where is the servant? And see, I believe in the providence of God. God had orchestrated circumstances where, where the servant wasn't there because the ultimate servant was in the house, and that was Jesus. And Jesus was about to blow all of them away with his, with his service. But he, he takes initiative. In verse 4, it says, He got up from the meal, and he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And, and after that, he poured water into the basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. See, a servant is one who fills in when somebody doesn't show up. That's what a servant is. Somebody didn't show up, let me hop in and help. That's the attitude of the servant. This is what Jesus is doing, getting his hands dirty. No, no task is too great. No, no challenge is too small. I, I, I'm willing to jump in there and to help. I, I'm thankful for some people that have served me. 
over the course of my life, people who have volunteered, people that have taken initiative, people that have said, I want to help Ryan. I was a, a high school student, and I was struggling in math. And, you know, they always say that you're really good at math and science or you're good at English. And, and I was good at neither one. You know, I don't know what happened to me. I struggled in both, in both areas. And I was struggling with algebra as an eighth grader. And my mom said to the neighbor who was a good friend of ours, uh, his name was Mr. Mack. And Mr. Mack, um, would you help Ryan with his algebra homework? Mr. Mack was a former math teacher who was now a principal. And he said, I'd love to do that. And he didn't know what he was signing up for because from the time I was in the eighth grade till I was a senior in high school, I was over at Mr. Mack's uh, house about three or four times a week uh, up to an hour at a time, getting help with my algebra. But praise God, I did graduate high school. Felt good. And I don't know where I would have been with, without, without the help of, of this math teacher who volunteered himself to come alongside and to help me get the grades that I needed to, to make to, to, to go to the next level. Thankful. He volunteered. Nobody was, nobody was standing around. He, he said, L -l let me help. Let me help. I'm reminded of, you know, a few years ago, my grandfather was dying of emphysema, and he was bedridden for the last year of his life, and, and my grandmother was very elderly, you know, at the time, and uh, they had a really big yard. I mean, the front and backyard, this is a big lot, big house, and the neighbor who was a Christian leader in his church knew that my grandmother couldn't do the yard, and she didn't have a whole lot of money, and so he just volunteered. He said, hey, can I come over and just mow your yard? And he did that for about three, three years until my grandmother moved and just committed himself to, to serve, you know. I mean, he wasn't asked. He just saw a need. And he said, I, I, I want to help. I want to do something. I wonder who God has put into your life or what circumstances that you're facing. And God's saying, just take initiative. You know, somebody needs some help. Help somebody. You know, don't make this rocket science. Don't make this too complicated. Sometimes God allows us to see needs because he is prompting us to respond to opportunity. Sometimes we see a need and we think, oh man, I'm busy, I don't want to do that. But sometimes God revealed that to you, showed that to you, because he realized you may be the answer to the problem. So let's take initiative. Servants see a need and they say, what can I do? Now sometimes we make excuses, don't we? You know, We think, man, I'm so busy, I got this going on, I can't get involved in that, I don't know what to say. We have a, we have a lady in our church... Her name is Kayla Cantrell. Some of you know Kayla. Kayla serves in our preschool ministry. She's here all the time. She has four children. One is a special needs kid, and then she got three other small kids. And her husband is deployed to Afghanistan, and she is serving all the time. She's here all the time. I mean, and I think when I see that, I'm like, oh, my goodness. If, if she can serve, if she can help other people, then then what can I do? What can I do? Because if anybody's got some excuses to not serve others, it should be the, the, the mom who's virtually a single mom of four with a special needs kid. And she cannot serve enough. It's amazing. It's amazing. So we need to be careful about making excuses. You know, sometimes God's leading us just to break through those excuses. And, you know, a few weeks ago, Gina was went into the women's restroom right over here. And Gina's my wife, if you don't know that. And there was a man in the restroom. How many of you know that's a problem when there's a man in the women's restroom? Unusual. Yeah, unusual. A big man, Roger Frank. He's like 6'5". You know, he's one of the biggest men in our church. He was in the women's restroom. And, and, and to make matters even weirder, he was standing next to a lady in our church, Beth Torpy, who is married to somebody else. They both have other spouses, and they're in the women's bathroom together. We don't roll that way here at Ed's church. It's, it was kind of unusual. It was kind of awkward. Gina walked in and thought, what's going on? The toilet had overflowed. The toilet was just gushing over. It, it had run all the way through the floor in the bathroom. It was running down the hallway, you know. And, and if they didn't do something quick, it may have run in here and it may have disrupted the service. You know, you could just imagine what that would be like. And so they just went in there and took addition. Nobody asked. Nobody gave an assignment. They just went in there and started working on it. You know, and I love that. I love the heart of that. That's the heart of servanthood is just, man, what can I do? God, where would you lead me? What opportunities would I have to, to help somebody today? And I believe that the local church is the greatest place to serve. It's the, it's the body of Christ. 
the greatest opportunity to serve is, is, is in your church. And we've got so many opportunities. Many of you know we've just expanded to our Saturday night service. We have three worship experiences every weekend. By the way, we had 150 people at Saturday night services uh, last night. Is that not amazing? We just started. We just started. And, I mean, that thing is just, every week, it's just getting stronger and stronger. It's awesome. So come see us on Saturday night sometime. But we've just expanded our ministries. we got opportunities to serve in almost every area of our church. I'm telling you, in our preschool ministry, amazing opportunities right now. We've got opportunities with the elementary school kids, with our security team, with our first impressions team. I mean, uh, our dirty jobs team. The dirty jobs people are like the people that are afraid of working with kids, you know, but they don't, they, like if your favorite room in the house is the garage, the dirty jobs team is for you, you know, and you got a place on your connection card, I hope you're going to sign up today and say, man, I want to serve, I, I want to be a part of this thing, I don't want to be a spectator, I want to be a servant, I want to be involved in the game because the local church is the greatest place to foster and to be involved in, in ministry every single week. So servants, first of all, they take initiative. Servants also do something else. You know what that is? Servants respond in humility. Servants grow in humility. Because listen, when you begin to serve somebody else, it begins to do something for your heart. You begin to grow spiritually. You begin to, to remember, man, it's not all about me. It's about other people too. It feels good to, to come to church and to not think about your problems for a couple of hours and just to serve and to help other people. Because everybody here has got some problems they're worried about. And we got to deal with those problems all throughout the week. But isn't it great to be able to just focus for a, for a couple of hours on something else? I don't have to worry about that. I can just focus on some people and, and focus on my spiritual development. I can focus on my, on my uh, service to other people. Because listen, when you serve other people, you will become more humble. You're esteeming others. And sometimes people think that being humble is being weak, you know, or insecure. Like if you're insecure, you're humble. It's actually the opposite. You have to be stronger to be a servant. You have to be more godly to be a servant. If you're going to say, man, I want to open the door for you. I want to get you a cup of coffee. I want to help you. What can I do to help you? You have to be more confident in yourself, not less confident. That's not what humility is. That's what servants do. So servants are confident in what God is doing in their lives. And you got to be strong to be a servant. Now, sometimes when we have these opportunities to serve, uh, we reject these. And look at Simon Peter's response at verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, and this is Jesus, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. But you love Peter's emphatic decline. You will never touch my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. And then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Don't you love that, just that 180 degree change and turn in Peter's life? At first, he's like, Jesus, you will not touch my feet. And then Jesus says, you'll have no part of me. And then Peter's like, oh my goodness, well then just wash my whole body. You know, Love that enthusiasm of Peter. Peter would have been a great politician because he was a great flip-flopper, wasn't he? Yeah. I mean, he's walking on the water one moment and there's this amazing faith. And then all of a sudden he sinks into fear. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and begins to look at the wind and the waves and begins to sink. And he's exhibiting great faith and then great fear. He flip-flops, you know. You will never wash me, wash my whole body. I will never deny you, Lord. I've never even met Jesus, you know, Peter's whole life. But you know what? When Peter screwed up, he, he did get back on track. So let's give Peter some kudos on that. He was this flip-flopper, but, but when Jesus corrects him, he responds well. And he's like, man, I washed my whole body. I mean, Peter didn't understand the spiritual implications of what Jesus was communicating to him. We need to be washed and bathed by Christ in order that our sins can be washed away. And, you know, Peter didn't get that. But Jesus pointed it out to him and he was like, hey, I'm on board, man. Wash everything here. <laughs> I love it. Because, see, serving, serving others 
it actually breaks down the pride in our lives. And sometimes uh, I have seen people that have prayed, God, send me some help. I need some help in a situation. And somebody shows up to help them and they say no. Why would somebody do that? That's pride. I'm not going to let anybody help me. I can handle my own business. I got my own life in order. Why do I need you? You've been praying for God to help you, and God sends somebody into your life, and you're saying no. That's pride. That's Simon Peter. That's Simon Peter right there. And so pride manifests itself in our lives sometimes by a rejection of people who want to help us. But pride also is revealed in the way that we look at other people's needs versus our own. You know, man, I'm busy. I don't have time for all that. I don't want to get involved in that. I'm kind of doing my own thing. You know, that, that can be pride too. Servanthood, service to other people, pushes pride out so that God's work can be elevated in our experience. And, and, and you know what? The more we serve people, the more humble that we'll become. A good friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, has a great saying in his church, and he teaches this to his church all the time. He says, if you're not serving, you're swerving. Isn't that great? If you're not serving, you're swerving. And, and I've found that to be true. When people begin to walk away from their Christian faith and begin to, to kind of dial it back a little bit and kind of begin to do their own thing, a lot of times the first thing they will do is they will drop out of serving in the church, and that's kind of the precursor to, to a lot of times a lot of other things going on because when we're not serving others, we're, we're swerving. When we're not serving, we're swerving. This was the disciples. Jesus is washing the feet. And they're arguing amongst themselves. In Luke's gospel, he says this in verse 22, chapter 22, verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. That's the disciples. So while Jesus is serving, the disciples are arguing about who's got the biggest and the baddest resume. How about that? When we're not serving, we're swerving. Have you ever noticed how many people want to line up to be in the limelight? A lot of people want to be center stage. A lot of folks want to get all the attention. A lot of people want to have all the applause and all the buttons and all the accolades. A lot of people want that, but a lot fewer people want to be behind the scenes serving and helping people. And so that's why when people ask, Ryan, we want to serve in the, in the band or we want to lead worship, our first question is always, where are you serving? Where are you serving? Because see, the people that we put on stage here at Edge Church, we want to make sure that they have the right heart to be on stage. And the right heart is, I'll do anything. If I need to be on stage, I'll be on stage. But if I need to be taking out the trash, or if I need to be rocking babies, or if I need to be helping set things up, hey, I'll do that as well. It's amazing. Everybody in our band and our worship team, they're all serving other areas. They work with the student ministry. They work with our dirty jobs team. They lead Bible studies. They make videos. They do all kinds of things because, because it's not just about the stage. It's about the heart. And we're here to develop servants, not rock stars at Edge Church. That's why we're here, to develop people to serve. So it's not a show. It's not... That we can you know, impress people, it's, it's, it's so that we can serve. We're glad to serve. Jesus said this, the first will be last and the last will be first. If you want to be first in your life, become last. Jesus said if you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. That's what it means to be a servant. And, and we need more servants in the local church. I'm telling you, we need more servants. Less CEOs and more servants. And, and, and you know, the only people that Jesus rebuked and got into their face heavily was, was really the Pharisees and Sadducees in the Bible. I mean, yeah, Jesus directed some people and he, he corrected some people. But I mean, the harshest, the people that Jesus spoke the harshest words to were the Jewish religious establishment. Why? Because they were people that were filled with pride and they refused to serve. They would pray in these lofty lofty words on the street corners and say, look how spiritual that I am, and yet their hearts were so far from God. And Jesus was always up in their grill because, because it was about the appearance, but it was, it, was, it was not about the heart. God wants our heart. God wants our heart. And, and the heart is the place where, 
where God does his greatest work in us through, through serving. That's why verse 16 says, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So we're all to serve. We're all to serve. And, and it's amazing to me how in a church that people can look at the same situation and have two totally different opinions. A servant sees a problem and the servant says, what can I do to help? That's what a servant does. You know what a critic does? A critic looks at the same problem, the same situation, and they criticize. They send out dirty emails. They write Google reviews. They text all their friends about the problem. That's a critic. God is looking for a church of servants. People that are saying, I want to jump in there and help. I'm a servant. I'm not a critic. You know, I've found also, I've been a pastor for about 20, 20 years, a little over 20 years now. And I've served in four different churches. This is true in every church. The people who complain the most are the people that do the least. It's true in every church. I don't know what it is, but it is just, it is just true about people. I don't know if this is in the Bible or not, but I'm telling you, this is the truth. People who are busy serving are people that rarely complain. And people that complain a lot are the spectators that expect everybody else to do everything for them. It's a big difference. So do I have the heart of a critic? Let me evaluate this. Let me point out all the problems. Or do I have the heart of a servant which says, I want to get in there and help. I want to make a difference. Huge difference. Huge difference. And it starts with this humble heart. We have a saying here at Edge Church. Uh, I'm called to do anything, everything, or nothing. Hey, no task is too big. No task is too small. If I needed to help with this, I'll do it. Anything, everything, I'll do, I'll do anything, I'll do everything, or nothing. And I believe sometimes it takes more humility to say nothing than it does everything because sometimes we feel like, well, that's my turf. You know, that's my territory. And I wasn't asked to help with that. And, and so sometimes we have to realize that we may not be needed at all, and we got to have a servant's heart in that regard as well. Anything, everything, or nothing. That's the mantra of the Edge Church when it comes to serving God and serving others. And, and that's why we have such a great culture of serving. More than 150 people are serving every week, every weekend here at Edge Church. It's such a huge deal uh, because, because we got a bunch of servants and, and very few critics. Amen? Here's what servants do. Servants gain rewards. That's the third thing. Everybody loves rewards. This is the payoff. This is the good stuff. Don't you miss this. Look at verse 17. Now, now, that you, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is what Jesus says to the disciples. Look, if you will do what I do, then you will be blessed. How can I be blessed by serving other people? Well, the first thing is... You get to see life change happen every weekend at Edge Church. We had three or four people commit their lives to Christ at their early service this morning already, sitting in these same seats. That happens every weekend at Edge Church. That's not the exception. That's the norm. You know, when people come to faith in Christ, it's not because, just because of the sermon. It's because of the whole experience. I believe this, when you welcome people to the church that it opens people's hearts to the gospel message. It really does. When you, when you smile at the door, when you direct people, when you love people, when you serve people, then people come into this room and they're like ready to hear from God. They feel loved and welcomed. It matters. Serving matters. We had a girl that showed up here a couple of years ago. I say she's a girl. She's in her, tw in her 20s. She's a, you know, a young lady and she had never been to church before. I'm telling you, she was terrified to come to church. And see, if you're a Christian and you visit a church, you know the drill. They're going to sing some songs. The pastor's going to get up and yell and scream and spit on some people. And then, you know, they're going to receive an offering. And then, you know, you go home. You kind of know what to expect. If you're not a Christian and you've never been to church before, you are terrified. You don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to try and stick my head under some water? Are they going to make me drink that weird Kool-Aid? I mean, whatever they're doing. And this was this girl. She was scared. And she was scared about where to park as she drove up. And you know what? An attendant in the parking lot said, come over here. I want you to park right here. And then when she got out of the car, they directed her to the door. And then she was worried about, well, where do I sit? Because I don't want to sit in somebody else's seat. You know, and I don't Do I sit in the front or the back or the side or the middle or, you know, where do I sit? And somebody directed her to her seat. 
and, and welcomed her. And, and, and as she was talking to, to somebody after the service, she said, when I came, I felt so lost. I felt so lost. But here's the beautiful thing. During the service, she committed her life to Jesus Christ, raised her hand, committed her life to Christ. Then she began serving in the church because she wanted to make sure that other people had the same experience that she had by serving. See, that's the blessing. The blessing is life change. The blessing is spiritual impact. And, and, and it is true that we don't always know what is going on in the hearts of people. And we don't know the life change. I'm sure that God is working and doing amazing things in so many people's lives. I will have never, I never know that for sure, what's going on. And that's okay because, you know what, wherever the Bible is taught and whether, where, wherever Jesus is lifted up, lives are always changed. But that's one of the blessings. Life changes happen. The Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, God wants to do a lot more in our community. But you know what? We need more people in the field. And, and I believe that's true here at Edge Church. We've just expanded, added this third service. And, and we need some new laborers to get into the field. Because the harvest is plentiful. God is sending the harvest to Edge Church every single weekend. That's not a problem. We need more people in the field doing the work so we can maximize what God is doing in our lives. Here's the second thing. You know what? When, when you'll be blessed uh, by, life, by seeing lives change, but also by growing spiritually. It keeps your spiritual life fresh. And it keeps us focused on what we need to do. Uh, it's like spiritual exercise. I think serving is. They say if you want to have a healthy body, diet and exercise. Our, spiritually speaking, our diet is the word of God. Our exercise is how we serve. We don't want to just be people that hear the word of God. We want to put it into practice. Diet and exercise. And then we also get to develop great friendships. Great friendships. I mean, if you're serving here at Edge Church, you're going to get an opportunity to, to, to meet, first of all, the right people. You know, if I could underscore that. And then also, you're going to make some profound and deep relationships with, with some amazing folks. Because when you get shoulder to shoulder with people, and you're serving all the time, then you get to know some great folks. You, you build great friendships. And that's what the church, the church is all about. See, there's two different mentalities with people that come to church. There's some people that come to church, and they say, what can the church do for me? And there's other people that come to the church, and they say, what can I do for others? Big difference, big difference. That's why people sometimes they're like, now how long is the service? Uh, what type of music is played in the service? What book of the Bible is the pastor uh, teaching from? Uh, you know, uh, what size is the congregation? You know, all that, that doesn't matter. What we should be focused on is not the peripheral things. What we need to be focused on is the main thing. And the main thing is that the church is a place to serve. That's what matters. It's not all about our preferences and all of our ideas. And if you went to another church, is this church like that church? That's not what it's about. It's about where do I need to serve? God, what do you want me to do? How do I need to participate? And you know, and I'm sharing this message today because I want you to have a heart for this house. I want you to love the church that God has planted you in. I want you to wake up on Sunday morning or Saturday night, whenever, and I want you to be excited about coming to church. I want you to be thrilled about what God's doing. I want you to be excited about the vision. I want you to be excited about the friends you're bringing and the life change that they're experiencing and what God's doing in your heart and what God's doing in your family's heart. And, and you know what? That's where church is fun. That's where church is a blast when we're just serving one another and we're caught up in this spirit of John 13 where we're esteeming others uh, to be more important than ourselves. That's, that's what the church is all about. So let's have a heart for the house. Let's have a blast and let's celebrate what God is doing. Jesus said this in Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's what God wants us to do, to give our life as a ransom.